We have the jolliest times at the table. Everybody laughs and jokes and talks at once, and we don't have to say grace beforehand. It's a relief not having to thank somebody for every mouthful you eat. I dare say I'm blasphemous, but you'd be too if you'd offered as much obligatory thanks as I have. Such a lot of things we've done. I can't begin to tell you about them. Mr. McPride owns a factory and Christmas Eve he had a tree for the employees' children. It was in the long packing room, which was decorated with evergreens and holly. Jimmy McBride was dressed as Santa Claus and Sally and I helped him distribute the presents. Dear me daddy, but it was a funny sensation. I felt as benevolent as a trustee of the John Grier home. I kiss one sweet sticky little boy, but I don't think I patted any of them on the head. And two days after Christmas, they gave a dance at their own house for me. It was the first really true ball I ever attended. College doesn't count where we dance with girls. I had a new white evening gown, your Christmas present, many thanks, and long white gloves and white satin slippers. The only drawback to my perfect, utter, absolute happiness was the fact that Mrs. Lippitt couldn't see me leading the cotillion with Jimmy McBride. Tell her about it, please, the next time you visit the J. G. H. Yours ever, Judy Abbott. P.S. Would you be terribly displeased, Daddy, if I didn't turn out to be a great author after all, but just a plain girl? Six point thirty. Saturday, dear Daddy. We started to walk to town today, but mercy. How it poured. I like winter to be winter with snow instead of rain. Julia's desirable uncle called again this afternoon and brought a five-pound box of chocolates. There are advantages, you see, about rooming with Julia. Our innocent prattle appeared to amuse him, and he waited for a later train in order to take tea in the study.
We had an awful lot of trouble getting permission. It's hard enough entertaining fathers and grandfathers, but uncles are a step worse. And as for brothers and cousins, they are next to impossible. Julia had to swear that he was her uncle before notary public, and then have the county clerk's certificate attached. Don't I know a lot of law? And even then I doubt, if we could have had our tea if the dean had a chance to see how youngish and good-looking Uncle Jervis is. Anyway, we had it, with brown bread Swiss cheese sandwiches. He helped make them, and then ate four. I told him that I had spent last summer at Lock Willow, and we had a beautiful gossipy time about the samples, and the horses and cows and chickens. All the horses that he used to know are dead, except Grover, who was a baby colt at the time of his last visit. And poor Grove now is so old, he can just limp about the pasture. He asked, if they still kept donuts in a yellow crock with a blue plate over it on the bottom shelf of the pantry, and they do. He wanted to know if there was still a woodchuck's hole under the pile of rocks in the night pasture, and there is. Almost I caught a big fat gray one there this summer, the 25th great grandson of the one Master Jervis caught when he was a little boy. I called him Master Jervie to his face, but he didn't appear to be insulted. Julia says she has never seen him so amiable. He's usually pretty unapproachable. But Julia hasn't a bit of tact, and men, I find, require a great deal. They purr if you rub them the right way and spit if you don't. That isn't a very elegant metaphor. I mean it figuratively. We're reading Marie Bashkirtseff's journal. Isn't it amazing? Listen to this. Last night I was seized by a fit of despair that found utterance in moans, and that finally drove me to throw the dining room clock into the sea. It makes me almost hope I'm not a genius. They must be very wearing to have about, and awfully destructive to the furniture. Mercy, how it keeps pouring.
We shall have to swim to chapel tonight.